Okay. All right. So what I want to do is apparently I want to review our apparently I want to review our operational procedures this year. You know, ending with the you know the pandemic and the adjustments we made. So I know that when we talked to the beginning of the year, we had a ellipse goal with, with some precautions. Yeah, we did our precaution plans for COVID nineteen. So we called some parents, and I know we had like we had forty nine kids who were coming in sixth graders. Yeah, the immediate with yeah. what we were allowed to with the district, and then seven about forty six seven graders and then eight. 55 acres coming in. I think through the middle of the year we had about 100 and about 224 total. So, you know, we had to adjust as we went. So, some of the things we did um, in the cafeteria, what do we, some of the things we did in the cafeteria, we. Uh, so, the cafeteria, what we ended up doing was so remember, we broke down, we had enough seating. Um, we brought out where the seats were only going to be on one side opposite of each other. That way, and the total number that we could have in any given lunch was about 70, right about students. Because with the numbers that we were given per grade level, we knew that 70 was the max in there. Per grade level? Okay. So, when kids were arriving before they got into the cafeteria for breakfast, what are some of the things we, that you, you did to yeah. ensure that when we were dropping off at the front? So, we had set up. Dropping off for the buses as well. So, remember to recap with that, we had in that very first few weeks of school, uh, we had parent pickup where we had Nurse Loretta, a president up front with two teachers. Um, they would enter through a designated area that we had roped off. They'd come through there two lines, six feet apart at all times, along with their masks and Mr. Salinas additionally helped with that. They'd come in, they'd get their temperature checks and to eliminate cross-contamination, they went through the gates of our courtyard the doors were already open so that there wasn't touching or anything like that. They'd come in and they'd go to the designated pickup for sixth grade we had in our practice gym. And then our seventh grade we had put in the cafeteria and the eighth grade had the competition gym. Um, so as they came in, we asked them their grade level and they'd go there for the back of the buses. So for transportation, our back bus loop, what we did there was same thing. We had multiple teachers, about four or five teachers uh, throughout that area. Um, if they got off the bus, they didn't have a mask, the first person they'd greet was someone that had a mask, they would give them a mask, a disposable one. Those kids would still be six feet apart. We had four different lines that were roped off, so four buses could pull up, swing the door open, come out. The students would exit, you know, in a timely fashion, fashion when they'd be six feet again. They'd come up, they would get their temperature checked, if everything worked out, they didn't have any symptoms, then they would proceed to the following line where a teacher was present in back of that line so that they never crossed in the paths and would enter into the designated areas again, six, seventh, and eighth grade area. So tell me about the seating charts. Why did you ask teachers to do seating charts during this time? So the biggest thing for our seating charts was- so the COVID time point, what was that for? Yeah, so what we did was, uh, <clears throat> Since we were still going to have a regular kind of bell schedule, we wanted teachers to have a seating chart with each uh, students that were enrolled in the class. That way we knew the designated area that they were sitting on. And basically that was going to be for any exposures or identifying kids that had symptoms. If they became positive, we could easily identify, okay, this is who they were sitting by. Was there by chance any way that they could have been less than six feet? That way, if we had to contaminate or get one entire class into a quarantine situation, we designate them and go grab those students. Right. So tell me about the water fountain. Water fountain. So the biggest thing is that, you know, myself and Mr. Yeah. Salinas and, you know, yourself, Mr. Argonne, was we wanted to lessen the amount of exposure. Um, so for pretty much the remainder of the year, you know, this year what we did was we covered all water fountains. Uh, basically, they were so operable, but they were covered and taped with signs that we created that said, do not drink, uh, that are, aren't allowed. Um, what we would do is, you know, the district was provided us with all the water bottles uh -huh. uh, for us to issue out to the students. Um, of course, that changed uh, later throughout the year, probably about, mm, I would say it was about March time, April when kind of the guidance was getting a little bit different from CDC and we waited till a lot of those restrictions were taken off um, and
and then our board of trustees, along with Dr. Hirsch, of course, um, went ahead and allowed us to reopen those back up and redeem the water bottles. Awesome. All right, so in terms of ensuring when the kids got into the classroom, how did we ensure that, you know, desktops were clean or that students were, they felt safe, what you just said in terms of, you know, distance and exposure and, and CDC guidelines? Um, so one of the things that we created was uh, the request form that yourself and both me and you created. Um, that form was one to track uh, the amount of supplies. I know uh, Mr. Figueroa, who was over safety for the district and the protocols and all that. Mm -hmm. um, we worked with him. He was emailing yourself, and then I'd help you assist you with getting the amount of quantity that we'd be receiving to ensure that we had enough for each class. What we did was with those uh, checkout or request forms, they would then request it, myself or you would sign it, and they would be delivered by a custodian to that classroom. So what kind of chairs were you giving out? Uh, we were giving out wipes. Uh, each teacher was given a individual box of disposable masks for kids, along with uh, the shields. Every teacher had at one point about 15 shields per room because of the desk shields. De desk shields, right. yes sir. Uh, that were put on the desk mm -hmm. and were kept, and that way we could record and track how many shields at any given time a teacher had. So many of the teachers were given boxes of masks, at least 50. The hand sanitizers. Box, hand sanitizers, wipes for the shields that were on the desk. And I think we even made sure that teachers received a, a, a face shield for themselves. Every teacher was given a face shield that we had checked out by our secretary to make sure that we knew that they were provided that. And I think we had some concerns too for kids who were not in compliance with the uh, with mask rules, you know, if they wear a bandana, they were asked to come to the state office, yeah. and if they wore bandanas, then make sure that they were appropriate, not so much a red, blue, or whatever. Just no. In terms of safety, no representation. Right, right. And so we had teachers that wear masks or bandanas. Yes. So we had to think about things like that, just to kind of cover different areas or holes that uh, are way of saying it yes. that may come up. So we had to address that. And what we would do initially, we would then maybe repeat offenses that may kind of move in that direction. Sure. All right, and then uh, let's think about um, Chromebooks. We talked about that and how they would be handled, if they need to be wiped and things like that. Just things that we talked about. Tell me about the care room. I know we talked about the care room. So our care room, yes, sir. So we can actually show you that you know, shortly, which was what we have is a student uh, to minimize an exposure or anything like that, we uh, created that electronic pass, nurse pass this year, where a teacher could easily fill it out, uh, informing and it would give an instant notification to our nurse, letting them know that a student was not feeling well in that classroom. That student would then be uh, picked up or they'd be brought down to the nurse's clinic when they came in. If they immediately exhibited any of the COVID-19 symptoms, uh, whether it was one or more, automatically they were going to be placed into an incubation room where we could monitor them and make sure that the general population was not exposed at a max. And thank you, Mr. Hillary. I appreciate your involvement with this plan. Um, so I want to move on to a different thing you're involved in, in as well. We did with the, we worked on this here. I think Mr. Clark helped, helped us with this. That's correct. And I'm talking about our fire exit routes, and I think he even helped with the uh, creating the arrows on the maps and making sure that our, um, our SRPs, our safety response protocols are in place. So can you tell me a little bit about how you helped us with that? Yes, sir. So what we did was a little bit different. Um, we took the general scope of the campus. We broke it down by first floor and second floor. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to make sure that it was easy to be read, whether a sub came in or someone different was in that classroom. And it was a, a general description for each teacher. So what we did, we broke down that image of, and the scope of the school per wing, A wing, B wing, and C wing. We did the first floor first, and we did the routes with the arrows. I went ahead and redesigned it to where it showed the exact location of where they would exit per given area. Um, we did that for our uh, upstairs and downstairs. And again, they were individualized by their room or sections. So. How are the custodians involved? 
and it's fine. So our custodians knew, so the custodians were able to help us along with their job duties. Uh, you know, they're given assigned hallways they knew to help us uh, by knowing where the route and exits were for that given wing, along with when we actually held our fire drills, they knew to kind of assist with Exiting. I think for what for us, I think one of the beneficial things in ha having them help us was that we were able to train them because yes. we discovered that n I would say none of them knew how to actually pull a lever or turn it off. And that was a big thing that we found out, you know, being a new campus and five years old, you know, the, capa the, 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 the capacity of our students to be able to do, do that. Do that. And also not having, you know, we found out that they weren't originally issued the keys. For the fire alarm and they didn't know which key it was and then we were able to track and locate that um so i think that was a, a okay. great piece yes and and really ensuring re-examining re making sure our staff are, felt yes i think it was absolutely amazing at redesign the maps but more so to have our staff know that in case that emergency even if it happens in the evening when no one's here our custodial staff now knows hey i know how to silence it mm -hmm. I know how to look and evacuate the building. So I think definitely with that training, an added piece of who they need to call in case this happens, and then I was following that protocol and exiting the building. Yeah, so I know you helped. I know you helped every month with the the fire drills. We were in compliance with that. We pushed them all. We turned our reports in this year, so that that was good. Um, that being said, um, safety week also went well, and we did all the drills that are part of the safety response protocol. Uh, whether it be um, shelter in place, whether it be a lockdown or secure, uh, things like that. Um, moving on, um, one of the last things I want to talk about is uh, the auditing of our keys. So, what was your experience with the auditing of the keys here at school, being at new campus and kind of taking a step back and looking at redoing that? Yeah. So, one of the biggest things that I think myself and you discovered when you know I came in was that our keys. You know, there were systems in place, but systems that may have not been working quite well for us. So as being a new campus, we wanted to ensure that we had an exact know of what keys were where. So the biggest thing that we did was we discovered the maps. Um, and those maps were able to help us identify who needed what keys, especially in terms of the key, code. the key codes, yeah. because our faculty, you know, we are obviously fortunate that they no longer really need keys except for the to close for the doors so we wanted to make sure that we audit him and when we did that audit what we determined was um, for a particular reason was that our campus um, was all given kind of a master classroom key uh, for every room and so it wasn't very safe nor was it something that we could efficiently uh, do so we wanted to make sure that we minimize that and we went ahead and we audited all keys along with identifying what key went where. Now we have a clear pattern. If we go into vault, we can tell exactly where they go. Right, so we know they're secure. So we talked about, you know, we talked about the, our COVID, um, our COVID response plan. We talked about our, our keys, that way we know who, what keys are issued out, where they're at, who has them, things like that. And of course our fire drills and building, building capacity with our custodians, so that an, an administrator might not be here, or someone who's knowledgeable needs to know that our custodians can cover that. That's if, correct. If need, if need be. Hi, right, Mr. Sully. I think that's uh, covers some of the operational things that happen on campus. Yes.